Hey everybody, welcome to Could It Be, an Oak Island podcast. This episode was a very special episode that we recorded live with Steve Guptill, and we just want to let you know that it might be different than our typical podcast, right? Yeah, it might sound a little bit different just because there's a chat going on, a face-to-face conversation versus what we typically do. So I guess without further ado, here we go. There is a podcast about an island in the North Atlantic where people have been looking for an incredible treasure for more than 200 years. Hello, and welcome back to Could It Be? An Oak Island podcast. We are your hosts, Deidre and Dustin White. Hey, happy and, Mother's Day. Well, thank you. Yeah, we got a special treat for you and um, all the other moms out there. Yes. Yeah, so joining us, we have a special, special guest today. We have Mr. Stephen Guptill. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to an interview. and uh, Let alone live. Yeah, a live one. And this is going to be very exciting for all of our listeners. So we just want to say up front, thanks. You're awesome. And uh, this is going to be a fun time. Yeah, I know. We like to check in on you guys. It'll be fun. I am going to say that we just had a storm pass through. So my internet um, is flickering. If I lose you, I'm going to call. So don't hang up. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Fantastic. We will see how we can negotiate that if we need to. Let's just hope it stays as it is. Right? Yeah. Cross your fingers. All right. Seriously. All right. So, hey, we got some questions for you. Um, sure. You don't mind answering. I guess that's kind of what the <laughs> interview is, right? It, rumor has it. All right. So, um, just right off the top, we're going to do a couple of uh, Oak Island things. We just want to know, were you a fan of the Curse of Oak Island before you started working on the island and, uh, you know, being part of the show? I watched the show. But I wasn't, so I started in season six. Um, <clears throat> so I, they brought me on midway through season six. So I finished with season six and then started fresh at season seven. I would say when I started, I hadn't seen season five. So I'd probably seen one, two, three, and part of four. So I had to catch up really quick when they brought me in. I, that I, I spent my first, oh, sorry. I spent my first couple nights in the hotel just catching up the last season and a half, just to make sure I was up to date. Hey, that's that's the culture we live in. We all binge watch things now. So you binge right. Oak Island to catch you up. And that's awesome. Did um, you're from Nova Scotia, or, or, like originally, right? That's right. right. Yep. I live here now. I have lived away, but um, I'm back in Nova Scotia now. Awesome. So did you uh, hear about the legend of Oak Island while you're growing up? Um, a little bit, but not as much as the other guys. I mean, growing up, our, my teachers, right? I remembered from elementary school. And again, they would be the same age now as you know Rick, Marty, Craig. Um, so you hear it through them. So you hear the legend of Oak Island through your teachers, which is sort of cool. And um, yeah, and they grew up with it much like you know Rick, Marty and Craig, Dave and those guys. So it was pretty cool about that. I didn't have the passion because I didn't grow up in that era, um, but something cool in Nova Scotia because frankly, we're a pretty small province and we don't have a lot of cool things, but we do have Oak Island. <laughs> hey, well, Oak Island, it doesn't get yeah. much cooler than that, in my opinion, say. you know. So um, I, I know that when I was young, I had come across in some kind of a book and I thought it was fascinating. I read up on it. And anytime I would come across Oak Island in some kind of magazine or some kind of, uh, you know, different book or whatever, because there wasn't any TV shows about it back then. But I just I was fascinated by it. And the fascination carries over to the TV show, mm -hmm. obviously. So. And let me let me say something, though. We do have a lot of beauty in Nova Scotia. I mean, our scenery is incredible, but in terms of fantasy and real hunting and something real and tangible, Oak Island is it, right? Like it's a real search. It is a real mystery. It is a real hunt. So in terms of bringing people to Nova Scotia, the beauty brings them and, Nova Scotia, and Oak Island brings them here. So it's sort of a twofold. People will come for one and they'll see the other. So they sort of get a twofold. So it's a very pretty province and we have Oak Island to boot. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, we, you know, DJ and I were actually planning on flying there this week, right, babe? <sighs> we were gonna leave Wednesday, and now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is fine though. This is a good consolation prize. It is. You know, it is pretty I, fabulous. I, I'm not gonna complain about this whatsoever, but we were planning on flying out there to hopefully hang out with you and some of the other guys, you know, <laughs> yeah, who knows what what yeah. would have happened, but and go on a tour. It didn't happen, you know, because of the times. What's happening? But. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, I, I wish we could have been there this week. You know, that's, right? that's what, that's what it boils down to for me, <laughs> but it is what it is. 
Okay. I think so, we you guys, that was part of the, this was supposed to be live all together, right? So, yeah. yeah a couple so that, was, that was a fingers crossed kind of thing we were hoping, but, you know, mm -hmm. eh, it is what yeah. it is. Yeah, this is a lot more than six feet apart. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so officially, what is your official position or title while you're working on the island? I mean, it's like you guys see, I'm the surveyor, um, mm -hmm. but I have data. So Charles will call me the geomatics guy or the geomatics expert, which is just a fancy name for surveyor. But that's really what I am. I'm, <clears throat> I'm the surveyor. So I spend my day running around to anything that we have going on. So if we're in the swamp, I'm in the swamp. If we're in the money pit, I'm in the money pit. If we're at the ball foundation, I'm at the ball foundation. And I often jump interchangeably mm -hmm. between the three or four. If we're in Smith's Cove, I'm there as well. So I pretty much do surveyor things and run around and collect data. So every time something changes or something is found, I pop in and pop out. So. You know, it's, it's funny that you say that because uh, it's you have to be kind of a little bit of everywhere. And when we were talking to Laird last week, mm -hmm. he was saying that if if he could, one wish that he would have about uh, working on Oak Island is to have like three of you on, mm -hmm. on site so that, you know, because everybody wants you. You're a real popular guy. Cool kid. <laughs> <clears throat> but Oak Island is very much like the the real survey world. It's mm -hmm. when we're on site, um, when something happens or is bound or as things progress, they bring us back to collect data. And really that's, you know, we have a collection of data now and I just run around and collect data as they, these guys do the search, right? So we have a historical record of where things are found and located in the holes we've dug. So I'm just keeping track of that. That's awesome. I have been complaining for a long time. <laughs> Poor Dustin has had to hear me. <clears throat> like, why, why do we not have somewhere to just collect all of this data? And like, yeah, but I always explain to you, I bet you it's happening behind the scenes and you just don't see it as much, but that's a full-time job. Well, it's great that we have Steve on the island now so that he can be, you know, he can comfort you, <laughs> you know, he can comfort you and others that are worried that these things aren't being recorded because we see it happening now. Because he's the Royal Cartographer. He is the Royal Cartographer. That's he what is... we dubbed your title. <laughs> yeah. So, well, no, we were so excited to see you like permanently join mm -hmm. the team, you know, because uh, it just... It, it you know, like she like she said because it kind of blew her mind that we didn't have uh, somebody on screen documenting everything. Even though we, mm -hmm. I'm sure it happened behind the scenes, but uh, it just it it makes the show better knowing that all that science stuff is really happening in addition to all the searching. Mm -hmm. So if you if you know what I mean, yeah, it does, and it makes sense. Um, you know, the data is a big part of it, and and it's you know it's nice that you guys get to see it because that's our research so between the data that i collect and the research behind the scenes it pushes the drive right so i mean i'm this big in terms of oak island i'm at the bottom but the data that i collect does benefit the rest of the guys right like the guys use the data to research and develop and we go through historical records so it's it's pretty cool to see how some of the stuff that we collect um, lines up with historical records it's pretty fascinating Oh yeah, but, you know that's funny. I we have um, one of our listeners, her name's Amy, um, Amy S. Yeah, she had asked us to ask you if, um, you know, in relation to what you just said about uh, old records or whatever, uh, Fred Nolan, mm -hmm. uh, have you been mm -hmm. able to decipher a lot of his stuff, and how much has that helped you? And um, so, I I know a lot of it. Some of it's aired. I've seen Fred Nolan's plans on on television, yeah. right? So, uh, some of it's aired. I've seen them. We do use them. I can't get into it a whole lot because some of it hasn't aired. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I'm on a slippery slope and I don't want to cross the line. Yeah, no. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm a surveyor. Fred Nolan was a surveyor. I've definitely seen his stuff. And he kept a fantastic record of where things were. So we, you know, I have built that into our historical search. Good. You know, Great. he was a surveyor and he did a fantastic job of keeping a record. So good. he did a really, really good job. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been hoping to see more of his stuff and maybe in the future, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just keep waiting and that's fine. You know, it's uh, something to look forward to, right? We'll keep waiting impatiently, and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's how we do. So it, how it, oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say his, his research and his search has not been gone to waste. So um, he did a really good job and we've used it to our benefit. 
That's amazing. That's great. That's good to know. So then how did you initially get involved with the Curse of Oak Island and working with them? So I am a product of what I would say, Dan Hensky and Doug Kroll. And uh, so uh, years ago, again, I wasn't there. Um, I guess Dan went to Rick and said, we need somebody to collect some of this data, right? We need we need somebody to come in and collect all of this data because Dan has all this knowledge and he just wanted somebody to walk around with him and collect data. So for the first couple of weeks, I walked around Dan and collected data and it turned really into a full-time job. They hired me to do, <clears throat> to put the money pit together. Um, the money pit had already been partly together. Terry was working on that. Um, and he had his own plan. It was, it was a fantastic plan. And I just took that and collaborated with Dan and hit some historical records. And I believe, um, I don't believe, I know they hired me to find Shaft 6. And that happened in season six. And uh, so that's how I got there between Dan wanting somebody to collect data and Doug wanting someone to overlay some plans. And it between the two, I magically appeared. Yep. And then you're <laughs> able to triangulate everything. It's been great. Yeah. It's, um, Dan Hensky is, uh, is really special. Wow. Like, it's so funny that he just remembers everything. It seems like, you know, and yeah. he just will be like, Oh yeah, this one thing over here. Oh yeah. This one thing over here. It just seems like he just, cause he's been there forever. You know, it's just, uh, he's fun to watch on TV. Uh -huh. it, it was really fun to watch him. <clears throat> so you guys watched this year, the certs for shaft nine, mm -hmm. right? And we dug up shaft nine. Well, that came from, me being with Dan and Dan, I remember him walking around and I, I honestly really didn't know what he was doing. He was just walking around, but in his own mind, he was triangulating and he was surveying in his own mind. And I just spent the day with him and, and sat and listened. And finally, after a couple hours, you know, we did some lines here and did some lines here. And then Dan went over here and he goes, I think shaft nine is right here. And so he said, I want you to take a survey point right here. So I took a survey point and this year it came up in conversation. We should find, you know, we should find shaft nine because shaft nine is a hundred feet from the money pit. We can triangulate with shaft two and we can find the money pit. And I'm like, hold on, Dan took me to shaft nine. I had that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect. So we, we, and that was something Dan come up. So walking around Dan for a couple of weeks, really, I mean, you know, two weeks of surveying and GPS is instant. We collected a lot of data. So Dan Hensky said it was here, and sure enough, it was there. We dug a hole and found Shaft 9 so because he, of Dan. So he triangulated it in his brain, and then he's able to say, hey, mark this spot. You mark that spot, you dig down, and that's where you find it, huh? That's right. Just like that, actually. That's Amazing. simple. Amazing. Okay. He well, used a tree line. So we know what uh, superpower Dan Hensky has now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. Wow. That's amazing. Well, it's like the coconut fiber in Smith's Cove when he just walked out there and was like, yeah, it's about here and like picks up a fistful of coconut fiber. <laughs> I'm like, how many years has it been? <laughs> just mind -blowing. It doesn't matter. He just knows. He knows these things. Yeah, that's fun. All right. So, hey, what, what inspired you to get into the industry of surveying? Um, so I was military before I was a surveyor. And... I mean, this is, I'm going to make a really long story, really, really short. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I didn't want to be in the military anymore. So I took my leave and did some research of industries that I could translate my skill set into. Turns out surveyors, they're dying in the world. So if anybody's listening and they want to be a surveyor, it's pretty good pay and we need surveyors. So there's some pretty good schools out there that you should attend, depending on where you're at in the country. We have a good one here in Nova Scotia, COGS. New Brunswick has a great one at uh, UMB. Oh, yes, they have Satan Nate. So we need surveyors in this world. And really, that was it. I wanted a good paying job and I wanted something steady, right? Steady. And it's math related. So you have to like math. But <laughs> that's a long story, really, really short. You had DJ right up until the you, math. You was. had me up to math. <laughs> <laughs> something like stable. Math. There's lots of jobs. And I like math. Yeah. Short yeah. story, really long. <laughs> nope, back, backwards. That's a long story, really short. <laughs> Hey, I like math. Do you like all the other stuff? I don't know. If it get, if it got me to Oak Island, I'd be all over I mean, it. I could learn to like math, maybe. I mean, I, I can teach you how to use my GPS. Done. <laughs> Sold. Well, as soon as we get out to Oak Open Island, we'll take you borders. up <laughs> Let's see here. Um, so how different is it working on a project like Oak Island compared to what you would do anywhere else? Um. It, it depends. So I've worked for um, 
a couple companies, a big one out West. I work for Midwest Surveys and they do everything, right? And it's a fantastic company. Um, and so a lot of what I did out West in Alberta, Saskatchewan uh, is very similar actually to what I do on Oak Island. You know, we would run out and we'd work on sites, whether they be oil or industry, uh, some type of industry or construction sites, and we just collect data. So it's a constant moving construction site and you're just running around collecting data as, you know, the guys are, guys and girls are doing their work, right? So it's it's pretty similar, which is good. Yeah. It would be a seamless transition. Except those other sites don't have like, you know, 20 cameras following you, you around, whatever, you know, recording your every move. <laughs> no. They don't, but you know what? Those guys and girls do a good job too because they don't miss anything and they let us go, right? Like they let us search and it's just the camera guys and girls and you know, the PAs and the ACs, they do a fantastic job. They are the hardest working people on the island because they're there before us and they're there after us and we work long days. Yeah, yeah. We've heard about uh, oh, yeah. uh, being there sun up to sundown. So yeah, yeah. The, we have a lot of respect for the production team as well because you know, if, if they didn't do as good a job as they do, we wouldn't have the entertaining show we have. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to make a TV show. Okay, Deidre and I, we hunt for treasure. We've yeah. dug for buried treasure before. And where we dig is like three feet down. And if we don't find it, we don't find it. But we know how difficult it is to find something just three feet down. Yeah. I mean, you guys are looking for something that could be 200 feet under your feet. And, um, you know, you don't find treasure every day. Otherwise, it'd be called treasure finding, finding right? right? Yeah. So <laughs> when you're out treasure hunting, it's just the most difficult thing in the world. Oh. If, uh, you know, if you, especially if you're digging. Digging is the hardest treasure to find, obviously. Yeah. And if you're not actually collecting all the data points. And that was, that was one of my big things is unless you know where you've been, how can you know where you're going? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why I was like, go to have someone collecting this data. Why would you put a hole down in the exact same spot twice? But yeah. I could go on and on because your job fascinates me and I'm <laughs> a little crazy, but there's that too. So anyways. Well, Deidre, Deidre works with surveyors off and mm -hmm. on through her regular work. She's a realtor. Yes. And so she's just always fascinated by what they do. And then watching you do it on TV just is extra fascinating I see because it's, like, it's a, it's on a subject that is near and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. So. That, that's good. Yeah. And that makes me happy to hear that so, at least two people are getting joy of what I do. So I have two There's plus a like, lot more. I don't know. Well, I hear like almost 10 million people watch right. the show around the world. So you guys are doing pretty good. All right. And, you know, and I don't want to forget to say this, and it actually works in well to what we're talking about. But like Scott Barlow does a lot to help me. That guy is a fantastic project manager. Mm -hmm. um, I know he once referred to us, I think it was on your um, one of your live chats as herding, what did he call us? We're like herding cats and we are because there's so much going on and to get us where he needs us to keep the search going because his whole job is to keep the search going, right? Mm -hmm. And and he does a fantastic job and he keeps us going and keeps us on his toes, but he's really good to us, but he helps me. Like he'll take my GPS and he'll run and tie something in as in survey the point that's, and bring it back to me so I can survey with my total station and help out Laird at the Ball Foundation. Right. So Scott's fantastic. Not only is he our boss, he's taking my GPS and running off and <laughs> clicking the buttons and bringing it back to me. Right. That's so good. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's really funny. You say something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. I I see Scott like stealing your stick and just marking like random things and calling them something else. I just that's. Oh, no, I said it all. And Scott, you know what? He's a really smart guy. Yeah. Oh, I believe it. But. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just funny that you bring that up like that because um, you're aware of it. We have like these trading cards we made of you guys. And um, so this trading card here is of you. And we have this superhero series. You're a superhero with indestructible armor. But it's just funny that in real life, Scott comes and grabs something from you, runs off because that's what he does on the back of your card in the little story. He takes your <laughs> home and runs away with it and making you uh, vulnerable. You know, he, he, that's your kryptonite, you, you know, having, not having to protect helmet. your head. <laughs> it's just, it's just funny. Um, yeah. So I didn't, I wasn't expecting so much nice things to be said about Scott Barlow today. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We like Scott. He's a great guy. He is. Yeah. So he, uh, he shows up sometimes in our, um, uh, like we do a pregame show and, um, 
our podcast and then we do the trivia on Fridays. So mm -hmm. it's fun to see you guys show up when you do. So yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, you guys do a great job. We all like to pop in once in a while. So. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. It, we have a lot of fun doing it. It's all for the love of the show, love of the, the search and of the treasure and of uh, the cast, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right. Hey, so speaking of like the people that watch you, um, what is it like to have millions of people watching you? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you literally have, uh, you know, Almost, millions of people oh, oh, watching you almost 10 million people watching <laughs> you guys uh you know depending on what part of the world mm -hmm. they're in all in, weekly basically right mm -hmm. it's just so much so how does that change your life and um i mean do you get noticed at the store right <laughs> right <clears throat> um so i just assume like I, I really like i don't think about that because it's not live right so to be honest, I'm more nervous now because I'm watching my bars thinking, oh, no, my Internet's going to go out because this is live. And I worry about like millions of people because you don't actually know what's going to make TV. Mm -hmm. Right. So they film so much of us. I think Kevin Burns did it best. They film for every hundred hours. You see one hour. Mm -hmm. So I just assume that, you know, you, you don't really know what's going to make TV. So you don't really know when to be nervous or not to be nervous. So you just you do your work and and you go from there. I. I can think of the first time I was on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a research center scene with me and I walked in and we talked about finding Shaft 6. I was nervous and I was really, really nervous. And I've watched that a couple of times and I just, I look like a ghost. So, <laughs> but it's a different world, right? It's the first time and you're meeting some pretty famous people, right? You're meeting Rick, Marty, Doug. Um, I think Dan Henske was in there. Like all these people you've seen on TV and then all of a sudden you're in a room with them answering questions with cameras, right? And it's yeah. nerve wracking. So I was nervous the first time I was on TV. Right. Mm -hmm. They tell you to forget about the cameras. It's not as easy as it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> you get used to it though. And they're, you know what? The guys and girls that carry the cameras, they're fantastic people. And they make you really, really relaxed. Right. So they'll joke with you when you're coming into a scene and they'll joke with you when you're leaving one. And, you know, they're really good to us. Um, they get almost everything that we say. The, the odd time they'll say, can you just repeat that? Right. So it's all real life. They're just getting our conversations and, you know, the production team does a good job of making, letting you guys see what we do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they do a great job as well. Yeah. So. We, we appreciate it. That I yeah, can't we, imagine. We definitely appreciate the hard work because without them, we don't have you. Right. So that's just Aww. the way it is. It's just the way it is. All right. Um, so uh, when you get to the Island, I mean, you say you work, you, you kind of answered this a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is just a question we have of what your typical day is, but it sounds to me like you show up, you know, real early, you bounce around the whole Island and then you <laughs> get out of there, you know, after dark or whatever, real late. So, um, is that kind of right? Yeah. I would say a typical day is 10 to 12 hours, probably putting 12. I would say seven 30 to seven 30 or eight to eight is probably a very typical day in the summer. Um, Long day. we have idea of what we're walking into. So we'll take the last half an hour and, you know, Rick's crew. So everybody mm -hmm. will sit in the room and we'll prep the next day. Right. So we'll talk about, you know, if Larry's going to the ball foundation, we'll prep that. If we're going to the money pit, we'll prep that. So when we walk in, everybody's on the same page and we're ready to go. Right. So, you know, the camera crew know, knows where we're going. We know where we're going. Uh, Scott's got it all planned. He's, he's talked with the production guys and girls and mm -hmm. that's a typical day. There's seven 30 or eight. And we're all there at, Till eight, and I heard Blair say last week. Sometimes it's hard to get Billy off the island, right? <laughs> Billy, will, Billy loves to work, right? And he that hunt, he loves it, right? So it's so funny. That was our suspicion all along. Oh right? yeah, we've been saying it forever. I bet yeah, he has the keys to the causeway, right? And he's the last guy to leave. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> he is. He'll work. He'll work to dark, and sometimes past dark. He'll just put his lights on and keep on working. That man has no quit, which is good, right? He's yeah. a good trade. Yeah, he's a hard, hard worker, and his guys and girls are hard, hard workers. That's cool. Yeah. Um, we just, we love Billy. <laughs> Everybody does, you know, we, right. do, we love the whole crew, but, uh, it's just, uh, something that's been like a running thing with us. We just say, yeah, he's, he's gotta be the hardest working guy in Not show business stop. himself, you know, cause he's just, we just, we imagine him just going and going and going and we just keep getting confirmation. So yep. <laughs> check. So where Rick, Rick as well, right? Rick is there Rick and Billy yeah. Scott. First one's there. We're the last three to leave. Man, those guys are hard workers. And Doug too. Doug would do research all night long, right? So mm -hmm. I was gonna say the three amigos, but they sound like the four amigos now. 
Yeah, I mean, the fellowship <laughs> keeps growing. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so where's your favorite place to work on the island? Okay, that's a good one. So I've talked a lot because I talk a lot about, <laughs> I work a lot of place, right? So I come in and I'm, I'm just called constantly to different, you know, Scott's always calling me saying, go here, go here, go here. So I, I do, but I will say, I enjoy the money pit search the best. So there's so much historical data, right? And so many plans and so many accurate plans. Like they showed that Shaft 6 plan this year. So I, I, I haven't seen every episode, but I've seen most and I've seen the finale. But I did watch one um, and they show us talking about Shaft 6 and hunting for Shaft 6. Well, that plan was fantastic because we calculated that and overlaid it and we hit the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I think we hit the tunnel, right? And they show that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it right. wasn't that Doug said, I think Doug said, isn't it great to be, uh, to drill down and ex get, and find what you're expecting to find? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what he said when you got, when you guys did that. So right on the nose there. Oh yeah. And the overlay maps, we're totally, we're <laughs> geeks and we, we like pause every map of yeah, ridiculous We get up next to the TV to take notes of everything. <laughs> it's a real problem. Yeah. But so the money pit's my favorite yeah, because cool. so much data and now that we have everything tied in from previous surveyors to me to past searchers, they're not even surveyors, they kept fantastic records, almost survey quality records. And so it's incredible to see some of these plans, just they work so well and, and they just assist in the search. Like it's incredible. Yeah, when we see those maps come up on the screen, we, you know, we basically think okay. they're works of art. You know, we would like to like frame them, you know, I think. And we uh, have so many maps. Yeah, we have a lot of a maps, lot. but we just think they're beautiful and we know how much work has gone into them, mm -hmm. you know, just because you have to take the data, like you just said, from all the prior uh, people searching and then you make your maps and it's just, it's magnificent when it comes oh. to fruition. We get to see it in all of its glory. Uh, of course, we only get to see parts of it. You know, we don't get to see the whole thing. We get to see, you know, a flash here and a flash there, but we're good with that pause button. Yeah. Like you said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. It's every uh, type A personality's dream. Mm -hmm. Like, where's the, <laughs> where's the <laughs> show me? <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Let's see here. All right. You work a lot with you know the big three right craig rick marty at least i'd assume <laughs> how closely do you get to work with these guys so i work with all three interchangeably right so um i would say i work with craig the most craig and rick the most um marty's a drive guy right like a scott guy like okay let's go do it now, right so it's a hard question ask in the amount of time that I would need. So I'm going to do it really short. Uh, Craig and I work really close together. I would say Rick gives us the rules. Rick gives us what he wants us to do. He definitely assists and does a lot of work, uh, both on the ground and doing the research. Um, a fantastic researcher. So he works well with Rick and Scott. I work with Craig really well. And Craig and I do a lot of the calculating with Doug. So I'm going to backup. Rick and Doug do a lot of the research. They pass it on to Craig and I. I'm going to make it really short. Um, and then we take that. So I would say in general, I work a lot hands on hand with Craig and actually Terry too. Terry's sort of, especially more in the money pit, the three of us with Doug's research and Scott's research and Paul's research and Rick's research. So we take that, we calculate it, and then we all sit as a crew and talk about it. So everybody pulls into, piles into the war room and we talk about what they had found what we had worked on. We use the scales, the historic plans, we overlay, and it's a constant, it's just a constant changing. And I know I'm not really ask, answering your question, but it's a hard one to answer. We all work so well together, is what I'm getting at. We're very calm, we complement one another, the whole crew. And then Marty will, okay, I, and this is what I really respect about Marty, it gets to a point where we've got, you know, the details to this close, and Marty's like, let's just go do it. So we do it. And he's like, you know, we've spent a lot of time on this and we've put a lot of man and female hours into this and let's go do it. So we do. Someone has to say, okay, it's time, right? You have to put the shovel in the ground. You have to pull the trigger. You have to, even after all the collecting, like I will collect to death. And then Dustin's like, okay, come on. You have to do something <laughs> with this now. You can't just sit on it. Yeah. yeah. It, you have such a 
great group of just even from what we're hearing of different personalities, different expertise. I mean, you can't build a team with all the same type of people. You just can't. Then you just, you just keep butting your head against the wall basically. Right. So um, yeah, like Deidre and I like to think that we're a pretty good team when we're doing our treasure hunting, Mm -hmm. you know, because we complement each other, just like you guys really complement each other. So Mm -hmm. that's really great. It's wonderful to hear. All right. So um, let's talk about uh, the resident of the island, Mr. (laughs) David Blankenship. That guy's pretty cool, isn't he? I could just guess. He is so cool to hang out with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's one of my favorites. Um, What you see is what you get. Calm, cool, collected. And he's, you know, he's, he's a, I would say he's a believer. Like his father, right? He's very passionate about his father's work. Um, definitely one of my favorite guys. He says it like he sees it. He's a hard worker. He's always been a hard worker. Um, good heart. Mm-hmm. Anything for anybody, I would say. That's great. Right. So that's um, his dad, Dan Blankenship. Uh, we all love him. Uh, mm-hmm. 10X. You do any work out in 10X at all? I, I haven't done much. I mean, I have its GPS location. Yeah, that's <laughs> or, <good. laughs> I've never been down 10X. I haven't done a lot with 10X. Um, so in terms of money pit work, I can, that's pretty close to what we consider the money pit, right? So I haven't done a whole lot with 10X. You know, we've we've correlated 10X with some of our findings. Um, but for 10X work, I haven't done a whole lot with 10X. Yeah, I just think to myself, I wonder if they're done with 10X. I mean, I don't think they're ever done done with anything. But, you know, I just haven't seen a lot of 10X lately. Well, yeah. yeah. I can't think of so again. I haven't seen every episode. I've seen most, but did they touch on 10x at all this year? I don't think. I don't think. I don't even think we heard it. We did. It wasn't really part of our search agenda this year. Yeah. 10x. Of course, it's going to come across in historical records, right? We spend so much time in Doug, Paul, Scott, Rick. We talked about that. They spend so much time looking through and studying, and you know, compiling records that 10x comes up. But it wasn't part of our search agenda this year. It didn't really seem to be. Okay. It wasn't part of the big three, as you, right? <laughs> well, they, they, okay, you guys really spent a lot of time in the swamp this year, a lot of time in Smith's Cove, and then a lot of time in the, the uplands, right? Mm-hmm. The uplands mm-hmm. were us. We, we, we don't hear that term mm-hmm. uh, before this season. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, that might have been like something they call, they've called that area for, you know, generations or whatever, but yeah. it was new to us. So that was fun to watch you guys do a lot of work up there. You, in particular, did a lot of work up in the uplands. So, uh, what was that experience like? Was it pretty fun? So when you're talking the uplands, give me, are you talking the shafts that we found? Yeah, um, like between the money pit between? and Smith's Cove in the cave pit. Okay, yeah. So we did a ton of work there, right? So we found a bunch of shafts and we found what we perceived to be shaft five. Uh, we found, you know, at 52 or 54 feet, we found what either is a tunnel or a shaft, right? And we don't, some of us think it's a tunnel. Some of us think it's a shaft. Um, I remember earlier in the year seeing uh, my face in a commercial and I said, if we're going to hit a tunnel, it's going to be right here. And that was the, <laughs> but that was calculated by Craig. Right. So there's Craig and I working together, compiling historic data that was based on the U-shaped structure. I think TV actually showed it because I've seen it in another commercial where they, they, um, I have this line based on the U-shaped structure that goes through like the cave and pit and heads towards the money pit and actually goes to DMT. And it was calculated by Craig. And that's where we hit the wood and what we perceived to be a tunnel at 52 or 54 feet. So there's the work of Craig and the team, right? So it's historic data. Craig calculates it based on the U-shaped structure. And sure enough, 52 or 54 feet later, we think we've got a tunnel. That's amazing. You know, you guys are basically tag team champs right there. You know, you guys, uh, you guys work real good together. Oh yeah. Craig's a great guy. I bet. I would love to talk to Craig. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, that's another one. We were hoping to be there this week so we could chat with all you guys, you know? Oh, Oh, well. Well, maybe we'll try to get there later in the year. All right. So what's next? Well, here, let's talk about he. Okay. You said you work closely with Doug, right? Mm -hmm. He He's on this 90 foot stone mission. What are you doing to help? Oh, nothing. That's theory stuff. <laughs> I'm too busy. I mean, I like some of the theory stuff, but I've got a, 
if I ever want to go home and go to bed, I'm going to stop. <laughs> so the 90 foot stone stuff is not really a, a me thing. That's more of a, a Doug, a Paul, a Rick. Uh, Rick, Rick, is, Rick loves the 90 foot stone, right? So there is tremendous value in the 90 foot stone, uh, but it's not something I've worked on. So I can't really touch on it too much. Fair enough. That's one of my favorite things personally too, because like if you could just get your hands on that 90 foot stone and, and figure out what it says or like, because who knows if the whatever's been transcribed or with whatever's been handed down over the generations is even right at this point. So for me, I just want them to like, I'm, I'm rooting Doug on like, go find it, man. Yeah. And you right. want Steve to help him, right? Yeah. Well, I, Steve's got better things to do, I guess. <laughs> well, got better things. I'm just kidding. We're all busy in different ways. The 90 foot stone is one of the things that I, I just didn't take part in a lot. So Doug, that's a really, you know, Doug and Doug, Rick, Scott, probably Paul as well. That's more, probably more of their expertise. And, uh, and, you know, again, Doug does a lot of really good research. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a hard yeah. thing to GPS when you don't know where it is. That's right. <laughs> if go. they give me a plan, I can find it. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, you've touched on having Terry there as, um, you know, a good right hand, uh, doing helping you with your work uh how helpful is it to have like you know a, an archaeologist on hand all the time uh all the heavy equipment people um you know like billy how how helpful are they with the with what you do um so again it goes back to whether it be oak island or if i go back into industry right it's no different one one thing about oak island we don't step on each other's toes so it's nice to have that so we're you know, because of Rick and Scott and Marty and Craig, they're all our bosses, right? And we're basically just an oiled machine and everybody works really well together. So when something's calculated, Billy's waiting. So he knows I'm going to be here because Craig and I and Doug are working on something back at the research center and he's waiting and, you know, it's, Scott's got him ready to go. So we are, it's tick, 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 go. That's all. And Harry knows, Billy knows, everybody's ready. Um, so it works really, really well. And it's really good that we all have different worlds. So we all live in different worlds. Right? I live in the geomatics world. Terry is a geologist. Aird's, uh, Laird's an archaeologist. So nobody steps on each other's toes and everybody compliments one another. So it's really good. It's a really good team. And we all work closely. At, like I said, we work in the research center. And so everybody is up and everybody knows what the next step is. Mm -hmm. You guys are a well uh, oiled machine, right? We are. We are. They keep us a well-oiled machine, right? They keep us on our toes, so it's good. Well, if you got it, I'm all about being efficient. So <laughs> I'm I'm glad to know you get your marching orders early in the morning, make the most use of the time. Yeah, that that fits right in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I'm perfect. happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we also see a lot of field trips happen. Okay, mm -hmm. they, oh, a lot of visiting other places. I get a feeling you don't get to go on many of them. Is that true? No, I don't even ask. I know I'm not <laughs> going to get out off the island. So, <laughs> yeah, ask. Well, as far as what Laird told us, like we said earlier, how important you are and you're needed in multiple places at once. Yeah, it could be probably pretty hard to get off the island. I mean, if you if you could go on one of those field trips, like they've gone on, uh, where would you like to go? Mug and anchor every time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good one. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I want to go on that field trip too. Oh yes. Many a time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Hey, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the work that Eagle Canada did over the past couple seasons? Uh, they've been setting off all these seismic charges all over the place. Uh, they, you know, basically doing an underground map. Um, I'm sure that's right in your wheelhouse and that it's helped you with, um, with your work. So, can you talk about what Evil Canada has been doing? So I know, so I, I can't, I can speak to the relationship that I have with Eagle Canada. Um, I work quite closely actually with Jeremy Church. And mm -hmm. I know that he's aired at least once, if not a couple of times this season. Mm -hmm. and his data was really, really good this year. So we, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe it was RF1 we used to sit over top of his teardrop, did he call it in his mm -hmm. episode? Yeah, yeah. Star one over top of his or avocado, either way. <laughs> okay, and so he used new technology to uh, to calculate that, and and uh, it was fantastic. So I worked really close with him. 
we used a lot of their data to push the search in correlation with historical you know, events and records and survey plans. And their data a lot lined up with the search itself. So RF1 was almost a no brainer because it went with a lot of the research and development that we, we'd already agreed on. And now we have Eagle Canada saying, you need to drill here because this looks like the money pit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we work really, I work really closely with Jeremy. I reach out to him once every month or every couple months. Um, when we're in the heat of the search, I probably talk to Jeremy once a month, uh, once a week, twice a week. So I'll give him a call. It's much like this. He's three or four hours different. So I got to wait till he gets out of bed, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we reach out. Yeah. They're out of Alberta. Is that right? From That's right. I think they're out of Calgary or Edmonton. I, I don't really know. They're out of Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Um, we're, we're always excited to see them show up uh, because it's just such a unique way to get any kind of data, something that we've never seen before because uh you know, I guess nobody's seen that kind of, uh, uh, seen it applied like that. How about that? Because mm -hmm. it's mostly when they do that kind of stuff, it's much deeper, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty amazing what they can do. It's almost like they formulated their explosions for us because we're looking in the, you know, 50 to 200 foot range and they're used to looking for oil and gas much, much deeper, sometimes kilometers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're explosives were essentially handmade for us or tailored to us. They might not have been handmade. They were probably tailored, <laughs> but they came in with a different program this year and it, and it was good. And the technology that they used this year really, really helped us and assisted us. Great. That's cool. Yeah. It's fun to see them show up like, uh, and then we see Alex, the giant, I call him. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's the only guy on the show that could probably dwarf you, right? He's a really he, big dude. He's a big guy. He's a lot bigger than me. I'm <laughs> and I would imagine he's six six or six seven. He's a big fella. Yeah, he's a big guy. Wow. Yeah, he's um there it's always fun to see them show up and yeah, like when Jeremy Church shows up and uh educates us with all that data, it's it's fun stuff. He did show up and um give us that teardrop and they dropped that can on it and you know that was so cool. Yeah, it was it was really neat. I wish there was, you know, some gold coming out of there, but you know, get some cool data, right? Data is gold. Yeah, data is but gold. not spendable. <laughs> you sound like Dave. <laughs> Everybody's got a little Dave in him, in them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, do you have any uh, thoughts, or I don't know if you can talk about it much or share your opinion on this maybe proposed big dig that we heard about on the season finale uh, of the mm -hmm. month? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I know you can't say much or anything, but everybody's like, asking just, though. Just whatever, <laughs> whatever you can say. I don't know. Or like, what, what do you think about it or what would you do? I mean, it's, it's difficult. I, so it is a slip. I, I actually don't know what I can talk about, about in the big dig. Um, because it's very expensive and it requires. So obviously I know the TV touched on it in the finale that we have spent a lot of time researching the big dig and we have, and, and it is very, very expensive. Um, I certainly have my preference of if we were to go have the big dig, what we should do and the diameter of the big dig. Um, but I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it. I think what you know in terms of TV is what you're allowed to know. So <laughs> it's okay. I'll just say it should be about 200 feet wide and, you know, 300 feet deep. Then we'll get to the bottom of it, right? <laughs> exactly. It'll be fine. It's no big deal. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> well, but. You talked about being a money pit guy. I'm very interested on your opinion on this toonie. Oh, yeah. That's a huge find, eh? Yeah, that was like, really cool. So, I mean, nobody expected that. So we're sitting in the final war room. And it was one of the last things to happen. And Marty pulls out a toonie and he's like, here. And we're all like, it's toonie. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth yeah. two bucks. And more like a buck 60 in the U.S., <laughs> right? So, and then to hear the solution channel, which is really, it's created this almost challenge on the ground that we already have. It's created a bigger challenge, right? So uh, we know it exists. Terry's done a fantastic job of mapping it and we have it created in, in our plans. So we have a database um, that we all work on and Terry and I and Craig and, you know, Rick, Doug, Scott, Paul, we all work on it intensively. So we have a data source where everything goes and 
Um, Terry's a big part of that and Solution Channel is a big part of that because it creates, I don't know, it creates problems, but it moves things around. And as you can see the tuning, I believe it went into H8 and it came out of, was it RF1? Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, that move, that's a 10 foot move. It sure is. Right. That, so, was that was one of our trivia questions. It was. <laughs> so, we can tell you're a data guy. Let's just. <laughs> <laughs> but that just, that just goes to prove that we're not just dealing with, you know, um, tunnels, flood tunnels, searcher tunnels, shafts. We're dealing with the force of nature, 200 feet, or it's 170 feet to 220 feet or 160 feet to 220 feet underground. That's pushing. So it's just like this mud river pushing things around. Yeah, that's oh, bonkers man. to me, like legit bonkers. Because for me, I think about, you know, if you drill, um, if you put a some kind of, uh, like when you guys are putting those uh, PVC pipe, yeah. um, the micro boreholes down, and they can maybe... Uh, they don't go straight down. Yeah. They go off to the left or to the right. You know, you, it's hard to drill a straight down, uh, a channel straight down like that. But when I think about like what's going on down there, I never really even considered how fluid it may or may not be. Mm -hmm. Like it just never even occurred to me. I was just thinking, ah, maybe it's muddy, you know, it's wet, you know, there's obviously water down there, but we never thought about things moving around. And so when Marty pulled that petunia out and he explains, Hey, I put this in, you know, you know, not, I didn't put it down the shaft, you know, mm -hmm. I put it down uh, uh, 10 feet over this way or whatever. Mm -hmm. It just, it kind of blew my mind and I wasn't expecting that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. So we were all, you know, Marty pulls out a toonie. We're all looking around. Gary was excited. <laughs> like yeah. it's a toonie. And then Marty tells us the story and it makes sense because the solution channel is documented in every drill, right? If we're in it, if we're not in it, uh, when we come out of it. And it's something that Terry keeps track of. And it's something that Terry has helped building in our data set. So between Terry's knowledge and you know, the research done by the research team and the on, on the ground data collection between Scott, myself, you know, Doug and Craig, the solution channel is a big part of what we do and a big part of the money pit search. And that Tooney mm -hmm. sort of validated of what we already thought was going on down there. And it really, it adds, I guess, another twist because we were really successful, we thought, in RF1 and it was a really good hole and we would have loved to have gone. I think Craig or Rick said it in the finale, we wanted to go another five or 10 feet deeper. Mm -hmm. Just ran out of casing and we were, it was coming in, right? It was just filling in and there was nothing we could do. And But it was a really successful hole. And we were you know, we were pretty proud of that hole. That and has the validation. Mm -hmm. right? Tooney validated that hole. So, yeah, that's it's incredible. It really is. I I just would never expected. Like, okay, so over the past couple of years, we see these animations that mm -hmm. uh, the production company will make, and they're fun to watch. You know, we see like the caisson going down and uh, clipping the edge of maybe the chapel vault and pushing yeah. it to the side. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. there's no way that thing's getting pushed. You know, it's just mm -hmm. a solid thing it, that's encased in a solid thing, but maybe maybe oh, yeah, you're now that yeah, it yeah. Me we move it it gets moved yeah and that's something we can keep track of too right so again that's part of our data search and when they show it being moved it's been moved because our when we um other drill holes will confirm it mm -hmm. cool so i have a historic record of where say hedden was built and we have a historic record of where hedden's been moved now mm, crazy mm -hmm. based on drilling right our drilling program is pretty intensive and there's a lot of data collection that goes in and Terry is fantastic, right? To keep on top of what we do in that money pit. I mean, I can only imagine how overwhelmed Terry must feel some days. <laughs> I bet he's just invaluable though. He seems like such a cool guy. Oh yeah. We love Terry. Oh yeah. Terry's a great fellow. He's hilarious. He has like all, we call these, call them Terryisms. Oh yeah. You know, he'll like exclaim like, hello Dolly. Oh yeah. Hold the phone. You know, it's just funny stuff. It's good stuff. They're <laughs> everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> it's a Markapalooza. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't stop. It's he great. would be a fun guy to work with. I'm thinking. Oh yeah. <laughs> he's a, uh, he's a good fella. He means well, he's smart, right? Like he know he actually knows a little bit of every, so if there's someone on the Island, you know how we don't step on each other's toes. Terry knows a little bit about a lot. And so like the other day we were talking about, Terry and I were talking on the phone and we were talking about some technology in my world and Terry knew all about it. So I was like, oh, it's pretty impressive actually. 
as a geologist, he'd need to know, right? Like, um, because he would use some of, we would interchangeably use some of the technology to assist in both of our jobs. So it made sense. So Terry's a really smart guy. Cool. Yeah. He seems like it. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, so you speak about your equipment. Um, mm -hmm. We see you with your, uh, your staff, right? Your prison GPS. pole of truth. Yeah, we call it the prison pole of truth. GPS. Because we looked up some uh, uh, surveyor tools and prison pole was one of them, right? Yeah, and we liked it. We liked it, so we went with it. And uh, one of your, you know, on one of your trading cards, we have you with the prism pole of truth. So anyway, your equipment uh, is pretty neat. Um, mm -hmm. I wish we got to see more of like, you know, I, I, it'd be how cool it if we got to see like inputting stuff on it or whatever, because we don't know how it works. We just know that it does work. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's cool. Oh, go ahead. No, yeah, go no finish. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this year, maybe you will get to see, um, the equipment's very expensive, right? So the difference between say me or a surveyor and anybody with a cell phone, you know, your accuracy with your cell phone is good to probably three feet to 10 feet, even 20 feet, depending mm -hmm. on satellite exposure and tree cover, and, you know, what else would cause interference? So, you know, your cell phone's a thousand dollars. The equipment that I use fluctuates on the market between if it's a really, really low end seven or 8,000, if it's what I was using Topcon, which was, you know, there's three big players in my field. It's like a Topcon and uh, Trimble. And they're in the $80,000 range, probably more about 60 American. And, but so you pay for the difference. I mean, the difference is where, you know, our accuracy is a couple centimeters or a couple inches, right? So I would say two to five centimeters or one to two inches. That is an expensive stick. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you only see half of it. The other half is the base station. Um, this year I bought new equipment, so you might see more of it. And I have a 3D modeling uh, uh, tablet actually. So I can like do some cool CAD stuff in the field. So maybe you'll see some more of it. That's cool. That would be it very cool. cool. It's really, it's just cool to see the technology you guys bring to this whole hunt. Uh, I heard that your uh, your surveying equipment talks, right? Is that, oh yeah, is that it, a... it doesn't shut up. The camera guys hate it. <laughs> That's really funny. But I mean, <laughs> it should have like its own like I don't know credit or something like I don't know. Name Actually, it. you know, it'd be really cool it, if you could program some it to say whatever you want. Like instead of like uh, I don't know what is it, what would it typically say like RTK. Ask Laird. It if Laird is watching this disease, this, it drives him crazy. It says a lot RTK fixed, which means I'm ready to work. And okay. my accuracy is now one or two centimeters, less can than an inch type of thing. Uh -huh. Can you change it to say I'm ready to work? You can't. It's uh -huh. all, right. with all kinds of sayings, but it's like, you know, telling you it's shot taken, RTK fixed, RTK lost. Um, it's basically telling you when it's ready to work and when it's working, but it drives everybody crazy. It seems like maybe the next generation, you know, those companies, if they're watching, maybe uh -huh. they could work into like just some sounds, kind of like Gary's metal detector, you know, yeah. like he knows, <laughs> yeah, he knows. Well, what it, sounds too. it does his little do do do. <laughs> That's fun. You don't hear that, I don't think. <laughs> we don't but my new one is perfectly, perfectly quiet. So if Laird does see this, Laird, you're, you're safe next year. My new yeah. one doesn't talk. Way to look out for Laird. That's so nice of you to choose some equipment that doesn't talk for them. Like, I know if it was me, I'd probably be just like put some headphones in and listen to podcasts, but then the camera people would hate that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so that's funny stuff. That's good. All right. So do you have a favorite theory about Oak Island? Like as far as, um, you know, Shakespeare or Templar or whatever. Okay. So I'm not a theory guy. But there was a couple of theories this year that I liked. And so if I say their names wrong, please forgive me. And I probably get a call from them later. Um, <laughs> so is it Chris Morford, I believe, and Corjan Mall? So I was part of that theory and I was part of the data part. So just the calculating, but just to work with those guys and hear the theory um, before they even presented it, because I had to work with them to calculate the Arcadia point and um, uh, th they use the Poussin painting, if I remember correctly, yep. and mm -hmm. work with them hands on and get to be a part of the research. Now, I didn't do the research. I'm taking no claim to any of it other than I got to sit and listen to them talk and calculate their positions based on their research and work. 
And I mean, we had a big boulder on the Acadia point or Arcadia point, and it was fantastic. So to be a part of that was pretty cool. And they're pretty good fellas, right? Like they did a lot of research and they showed up well prepared and ready to roll. And I mean, that war room was, I mean, they went in and presented their data and, and we hit on it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I could tell when they showed up that, um, they were taken very seriously because very. they ba they basically came back multiple times uh, throughout the season, or at least they were sh they showed up over and over because uh, like Rick would I think Rick showed um, uh, Doctor Spooner mm -hmm. like um, hey you know or I, maybe it wasn't Doctor Spooner he showed somebody and he's like showing him on his phone and it's just like wow he, they must have really struck a chord with Rick yeah and I would love to talk to them at some point because like for the viewer it doesn't I don't know if it comes across as well as it comes across for you because you don't you know they get to tell us in 10 minutes rather than you know you spent hours with them and it makes more sense to you guys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So i'd like to know more about it because for me like when i'm watching them it's like okay it looks cool but i i don't really understand mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it made sense to me just because i got to be a part of it and by i got to be two hours of a part of probably months and months of research right yeah. so but it was pretty cool to hear they were they were just so fluent and you know um, they were really confident in their work. So every time I had a question and I need to calculate something, they were just, there was no second guessing. They just knew and they knew how to answer it. And everything just the, came together so well for that war room. So based on all of their research and that little bit that I just chucked into CAD and calculated and not chucked in, but I calculated in CAD and, and it worked out really well. Now we found a lot of stones and rocks in the swamp. We had a huge one on the Arcadia point. And I believe, if I remember correctly, didn't Dr. Spooner, and they would have aired, I believe this aired, didn't Dr. Spooner find a um, a twig under that? Uh, I'm not sure if it was that rock, but yeah, they definitely found the twig. Oh, they're, they're sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that was one of his major data points that he presented at the, at, on the last episode of the season. Mm -hmm. You know, that could have dated it back to 1200 or so, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, like the swamp is old and it appears all to be man-made. So why are we finding sticks under rocks? Good question. Yeah, that's something else we wanted to chat with you about as far as uh, working with Dr. Spooner out in the swamp and all the stuff you did out there. We saw you out there multiple times. You were wading through the water, helping uh, them do GPR over it back and forth. Mm -hmm. We saw you uh, in a boat while Gary was doing his uh, yeah, like prodding. prodding. Well, he was like, Gary was doing some... Um, yeah, with what looked like a giant cross he was holding. It's a whole different <laughs> yeah. type of Drayton's cross, but you know... <laughs> You've spent a lot of time in the swamp. Yeah, I did. I spent a lot of time. Is it really as stinky as uh, Marty says, or is he just kind of like? Oh no, it's. I mean, it's stinky. Okay. It, it depends on where you step too. It's like you step on these little gas pockets, and they release just this torturous death smell. <laughs> torturous death smell. Other right. spots aren't that bad, but the swamp itself can be pretty stinky. Um, it. When we were with the GPR guys, it was a cooler day. I remember, and we were dressed in jackets and hats and stuff, and. It wasn't so bad because it was cooler, but if it's a hot, stinky summer day and it's humid in Nova Scotia, it's, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> that does not appeal to her. I had she no desire to spend time in the swamp. And then they started finding things and I was like, mm -hmm. fine, I don't have to smell it from here. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I would, I'd be fine working in the swamp. I'd, Could I'd you be smell? Bait, probably but because i i it, the smells don't get to me like they get no to me. no so, not at all yeah the the swamp fascinates me in season six they talked about the first episode they talked about the big three the swamp the mm -hmm. money pit and smith's cove and then they didn't do anything in the swamp so when we got to season seven and we hit the swamp hard it made me really happy because i've been looking forward to getting you know to seeing you guys work there you know and so we got a lot of it and we're we're extremely pleased with that mm-hmm so. The swamp was huge this year. Um, it, I don't know which part consumed more time. I guess it depends on who you talk to. I would say the big three consumed an equal amount of all of our times. Smith's Cove was a huge undertaking. Um, Monty Pit was a huge undertaking. And the swamp was a huge undertaking. And I mean, we spent, it didn't matter really who it was. We all interchangeably spent a lot of time between the three. Um, I didn't mind the swamp. I spent a lot of the first, I spent a lot of time throughout the season in the swamp. Um, I didn't mind it. I don't mind being in the swamp. I didn't mind getting dirty. It's not so bad. And I wouldn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
know. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't drink it either. And that's that that moment with Rick t- sipping that swamp water. That was really bad. <laughs> you were there. But Rick's tough, right? Like, dude, that wouldn't hurt him. He's tough. Kill the rest of us. But Rick, man, that guy, he's, he's tough. There's something he just tough. tough. No words to describe how tough he is. He looks tough. He does. He is tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, he had he got sick last year, in, like in season six yeah. or was it season five? It might be five. And, yeah, it might have been five. But then he like came back stronger than ever, and um, yeah, he's just maybe he's super human. Actually, he's got to be one of the hardest working people, Seriously. like on um, the planet, not on the planet. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's, he's got so no dedicated. quit. Yeah, he's so dedicated. Yeah. You could just see it in his eyes. He just yeah. is so passionate. And uh, oh, we got him right here. Like Rick is. Yes. Rick is awesome. We love that guy. Yeah, seriously. But heavy on the swamp. Okay. We started the season with a ship shaped anomaly. Mm. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings on said ship shaped (laughs) anomaly? Well, we didn't hit it, but we did find (laughs) ship parts. You did. Um, But we didn't hit it in the drilling. So we didn't really get an answer one way or another. Um, I know I did listen to the Laird interview and I did hear Laird say he doesn't believe there's a ship. So I actually don't know what to say. I know that the data that we collected this year in terms of drilling, we missed or it's not there. Um, but that said, I do believe that that was once an open cove used for boats and ships. And it, the swamp is somehow connected to that pave area. So that's something I do believe. I do believe it was used for boats and ships. Uh, we just don't know what it was used for. So you don't think it was a open, like two separate islands that were filled in at one point, like as far as like man-made filled in, it would have been just like a, an inlet of sorts. And then the paved area was for attached to it. So that would be, yeah. I sort of say that in the final war room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I touch on how I think it was just an inlet. So basically up into the paved area or the peninsula that we stand on a lot, that's Fred Nolan's peninsula. He pushed that out during his research. And uh, I think that was probably an open cove at one point connected to the ocean. Mm. And it was used, potentially used for an inlet for boats, small ships to come in and out, maybe deliver whatever was going on in that period, right? Like you you guys have seen the dates now. We're talking 1200s. What was that going swamp on? looked like 1200s, so... Yeah, well, what's going on on Oak Island in the 1200s? Like, that's like before Columbus. We don't know. That's way before Columbus. <laughs> uh. Like, we did, so the thing about this year, we did so much work and we get so many answers, but now we, it's like we're back in the same boat because we did all this work and get so many answers, but it led us in a different direction or not in a different direction. It just gave us more data mm-hmm. to work with. And now we're working with real dates that are what 99.9% accurate. So... You know, we've got wood in the money pit from 1700s. We've got the swamp in the 1200s. Like, how do we connect those? And that's that's really the next part of the search is how do we connect those? What does the solution channel have to do with it? How come that tune moved? Um, let's go back to the, you know, the, the potential uh, tunnel at 52 or 54 feet. So how do we connect those with those dates? Because we have dates now that confirm them. And we just need to tie those three places together if we can, if they're connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. A good it, point. It's funny to hear like Marty talk about, you know, he he just would have never expected so much stuff. Like you had that timeline on the last yeah. episode, he wasn't expecting to have nearly that much stuff on the pre seventeen ninety five timeline, and now like it goes off of the table mm-hmm. basically with the twelve hundreds and everything. It's just like, you know, you're it's mind blowing stuff. Like, what what was going on? What were people doing there? Mm-hmm. Why is there? Um, you know, the uh, paved stone area. Oh my gosh, like, that paved stone like, area. What is, what happened there? Like, I, I know that you can't answer it, but I mean. Us, it, but we don't know. Yeah, it, all, it keeps us all on the edge of our seats, you know, and that's mm-hmm. what we love about it. So. The the paved area itself, I mean, it's, it's we could go back and probably do a season's worth of work just on the paved area because it's this flat surface and it's roughly, plus or minus a little tiny bit, it's roughly 80 by 170 feet. So 80 feet east west and 170 feet north south and it's just big rectangle like what is it and it's really well constructed and it's pretty flat um in terms of elevation there's not a lot of elevation difference Mm -hmm. over over the paved area and so it's this big flat surface that's connected to one 
once what could have been an open cove. So how does that play into the money pit in Smith's Cove and the uplands if it does at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something funny about um, when you first started, when the show start, first started showing us stuff about the paved area, we had Tony Sampson. Uh, he had uh, kind of discovered it mm -hmm. as far as the show showed. And then we had Gary out there doing some stuff. And then when they start, when they finally drain the swamp and we have, um, who was it? <sighs> Um, oh, we had Craig out there and he's like, you know, this wasn't, isn't what I was expecting to see. And he seemed mm -hmm. almost disappointed with it, everybody but, did. but then everybody, then it just went, you know, like, so it, it became such a big thing, you know, uh, the eye of the beholder, like saw something different at the beginning. But then when you started learning more and more and more, it was just kind of mind blowing and, and pretty amazing. Right. And, and we connected the paved area, if I remember correctly, because I'm pretty sure we had a war room about it and i think it aired because i remember seeing it in the commercial where doug and rick go to is it was it lewisburg mm -hmm. yeah and we connected the structure of what they had and their their rock floors yeah uh, it felt very similar to our paved area yeah. so yeah, for the they had it made sense yeah and then they had like those big carts that um oh, yeah. they had with the huge wheels and that would have been you know uh, i think doug said and that's the kind of uh, transportation vehicle of the day that could have easily moved over those kind of paved stones. Mm -hmm. You know, like they wouldn't have just got stuck in a rut if, uh, you know, yeah. the way the way that they moved back then uh, with those giant wheels, how they would have moved over the paved area. So it's just amazing. I don't know. Yeah. The, I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of work. You guys know that, I mean, drilling down, Doug's out there, right? Like, so you guys know Doug's out there doing research, never stops. Never. Um, can't stop. We're just waiting for this virus to go away or we get a vaccine or, Something. you know, some restrictions be lifted. And, you know, I'd like to be back out there helping them. But like you guys can see, we, we have, you know, you hear it a lot, but it's the truth. We, we do all this work. We get all these answers, but it, it, it almost gives us more avenues to go down. So we, we get so, so much information and it just gives us more questions than answers. And you hear that a lot, but it's the truth. Yeah. Well, people love, Oak Island. And as long as you and the rest of the team are out there, you know, doing your work and showing us what even could be, uh, we're all going to stay here and watch it. Right. Oh yeah. I ain't mean, going anywhere. The, the fans aren't going anywhere. They're so invested. They love it so much. And, um, we just hope that, uh, um, you know, history channel Prometheus and, uh, Marty and Craig just keep uh, funding it all so that we can all continue enjoying <laughs> right. one of our favorite pastimes, which has become uh, Oak Island stuff. So, yeah. you know, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's get back on some of our other questions though. Sure. So very curious if you had a chance to do someone else's job on the Island to learn it, to do it, to be that person for a day or a week, who would you be? Ooh. We ask the hard questions here. <laughs> I work with everybody, right? Yes. And um, so I get a little bit of taste of every, like what everybody does, mm -hmm. which has been great for me. I don't know. Like I really like what Laird does. I like the archaeology. Mm -hmm. Going slow doesn't bother me as much as I thought it would. I thought that because Laird's not really slow. Like that trowel, he can go to town. Like he can dig a hole with that thing. You should watch him go. Like. I could never do that, but I enjoy that. And then Laird comes up with these crazy things, like, you know, just pottery and stuff, but it's crazy when he pieces it all packed together. Like yeah. on his Facebook page and take a look, he pieced something back together. That was crazy. Like they, it's fantastic. Wow. Well, you know, I think Laird might be sure that you're uh, into archeology. span He thought that maybe it was only Jack Bagley that was interested. Cause I, he said that Jack would be a good archeologist. He did. Oh, I'm probably not a good, I'd be awful, but I enjoy it. <laughs> he said he needs more of you guys. It's just that you never got, you couldn't stay anywhere for any period of time. So we don't know if you're a good no. archaeologist or not. I'm probably not, but <laughs> but I did enjoy it. And I do enjoy being at the table with Terry because Terry and I, again, so in terms of search research, Terry and I work really closely. Okay. Like Terry, I, Terry, myself, Doug and Craig uh, with Rick, Scott, Oh, that's sort of like the research. It, it just keeps on going. And I'm probably using names, but um, a lot of us can do the research. But I work a lot with Terry in terms of the money pit research, and I like to be in the money pit. Yeah. Uh, the money pit's <laughs> pretty, 
I, I would be Laird or Terry. <laughs> cool. Okay, so do you feel with any type of certainty that there's still a treasure there or that there was one ever collected or that it's just collective madness or so you, we get you know you've seen the dates from the old wood right that predates what we believe to be are right around the same period as we believe the, the money pit so um my theory is i don't really have a theory but my the data that i've collected suggests one of two things the money pit exists and the treasure is there or it's moved. Well, I guess it's going to be three things. The treasure is still there and the solution channels pushed it um, or it's gone. So it's there, the money pit, the solution channels pushed it or it's gone. There's my three things. Um, I think the channels pushed it. I think we probably have enough evidence to suggest that it for sure existed and um, I think that we're probably on to the same belief because we all want to keep searching that it's been moved by the solution channel. Okay. So cool. what do you think or hope it is though? I don't know. I know. I can't even, I don't know. That would go to real. <laughs> I don't know. For me, it doesn't matter um, because I don't know. Like it's not that it doesn't matter. I, Whatever the guys want, right? If they want their riches, they can, they can have their riches. Um, we know it to me, it was, part of, it would just be about finding it, right? So to me, it doesn't matter what it is. I just want to find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, it's funny. We were talking to Vanessa last week, and she's like, "I don't know if I want to be the girl that pulls up the Ark of the Covenant. I kind of do, but I kind of don't." Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> I think if I had to lean towards something, I would pick that. Yeah, I'm I pick my finger, thing, what I want it to be. Yeah, something really valuable in terms of just knowledge that just nobody knew, right? So I think that might have more value to the world than a treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not the one who benefits from that. So to me, it would just be, I just want to find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you guys are like, you could be rewriting history. You know, that's a big deal, right? So, yeah. Uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? Yeah. And so you're finding stuff that proved that, you know, not necessarily Europeans were uh, doing whatever in the swamp with the paved area, but somebody was, could have been Europeans. Who knows? Maybe. I'm crossing my fingers that it was. Uh -huh. But I just hope, I just hope that you guys uh, are rewriting history. You know, that's going to be yeah. the thing that lasts the longest, right? Like if you read our history, then that's the history from then now you're on. in history books. <laughs> yeah, so. Like that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, that's I don't think anybody's looking for the uh you know, nobody what's the word? Nobody I mean they're not gonna talk about a Steve Guppel. It, for me it's okay. just being a part of the, the team that finds it, right? So um it, it would be cool to be a part of the team that finds it. Your name will be and in I, there. Oh yeah. I mean, we won't let anybody forget it. That's right. <laughs> uh, so that's awesome. I, I mean, um, another part of Deidre's question was, uh, do you think maybe it was, um, it could have been found and just not documented? Maybe like a Samuel Ball went in there and found it. I, to me, it's, nope. that seems a little far-fetched because it's so deep that you guys are thinking mm -hmm. that it could be. And I don't see one guy, you know, cabbage farmer digging down you know, 100, part of it. 150 feet by him. himself. I know you're rooting for him, but I'm rooting for him. Okay, I'm rooting for Steve and the guys. You might be rooting for Samuel Ball, but I hope Steve and his buddies find it first. I bet they will. <laughs> well, here's some. I, I think if somebody were to go to the effort, there would have been an historic record somewhere where the money pit was left open. Could you imagine digging 130 to 220 feet deep? You know, that, that's some of those shafts, right? 120, 130 feet. Um, if it's down in the solution channel, it could be 220 feet deep. Could you imagine somebody digging a hole and then filling it back in just for the sake of filling it back in? Who cares about filling it in? Yeah. Run. Yeah. You're rich. Oh. Right? Like, take it and run. That makes more sense than almost anything that uh, I've heard. Okay, <laughs> but if that was not the intention of the way to receive the treasure, there's got to be an easier way to access it than digging that deep, right? I mean, you're not going to, if you want it to be retrieved, I don't think you're going to expect yourself to go dig 
200 feet or whatever. Deidre wants her backdoor theory or the backdoor theory. Or I want like, a backdoor. She wants the hatch from Xena's map to open up and go lead to a tunnel that's nice and uh, brightly lit okay. on the right day with the sun shining down the, uh, yes. the tunnel. And then you can get it, right to the It'll money be a pit. beautiful moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Find it. <laughs> that, say it again. I said, I just, for us, we just want to find it. So um, I think, yeah, that's what the search is leading us to. And I think most people would be on the same boat this year in terms of, and the pun was intended for that on the same boat. Um, <laughs> Nicely. That, uh, it, it, you know, the money pit's a real thing and the treasure is lost in the solution channel. And I think that's what keeps us all going. The tuna is sort of, that, right? Yeah. And you guys okay. are going to find it. I hope so. I think we're right there, right? Like, I think it's close. For sure. That solution channel, I'm telling you, after the, the finale, we had quite a conversation about just like, wow, I, I just didn't believe that was a thing that could happen. Yeah, I just it didn't even cross our minds ever that there could be just like a, a, a muddy river flowing beneath the uh I talk about uh, well or whatever. But this is just nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So, which member of the fellowship would you like to take on as a surveying apprentice if you had to? Peter Fernetti. <laughs> mm. He'd be good. Yeah, he'd be good. I mean, Alex is an engineer, oh. so he would just sort of take over. <laughs> right, right? Like Alex is so smart. Um, if I was going to work with every anybody day in and day out. I'm going to take the purse. I don't know. That's a tough one. And Jack, I'll tell you some survey assistants, they can make or break you. And that guy, Jack, there's no quit, right? Like he'd be a good survey assistant. I believe because it. Because he just go, go, go. What you see on TV, that is Jack Begley, right? Like he's passionate. He digs holes faster than anybody. And I mean, that is a surveyor. That's what we want. We want somebody to dig a hole and pound something in and move things around. And I mean, Jack Begley, he's the guy, right? What you see with Jack is what you get. I think I take Jack. Jack attack. Or Scott. Or Scott. Scott Scott's good. But Scott's the boss. He just wanna take over. So I'll take Jack. <laughs> I was gonna say, is Scott gonna listen though? I don't know. He'll let me know later if he watches this. I'm sure he'll send me a text or something. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be filling out my surveying assistant application and sending it over shortly. Um, you don't like math, so stop. Yeah. It's not gonna work. He can do the math. Okay. I'll just run stuff around and dig holes. It's totally go. fine. It's there totally fine. I have it all figured out. All right. <laughs> all right. Hey, um, do you have any fun moments you can chat about concerning William Shatner's appearance on Oak Island this year? I I mean, I liked him. It was pretty cool, eh? To meet William Shatner. I'm a surveyor sitting in a war room with William Shatner. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So cool. Yeah. He's it was, if we talk about the moments I was nervous. My very first, you know, episode, and then, you know, you're in a room with William Shatner. Right? He's been doing it longer than I've been alive, and he's really, really good at what he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was fun yeah. to watch. He was fun. It was fun to see him uh, ask his questions and then get to experience kind of like, you know, you guys laying it down for him, like showing him, hey, this is why we think of this, you know, whatever. It was mm -hmm. just, it was fun to watch for as viewers. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was pretty good. He was good to me, right? He was nice, and he took the time to get to know each one of us. So um, it was pretty cool. I mean, I get to meet William Shatner. Pretty neat. I mean, how You have the I, coolest job ever. Yeah, I bet you didn't think you were going to be doing that uh, three, four years ago. No, no, no. If you had asked me three years ago, I would have been at COGS probably for the rest of my life. And uh, here I am three years later. You know, working for Rick and Marty Lagina and meeting William Shatner. So how cool is that? You have a pretty cool life. Wow. Really cool life. Yeah. Um, and you get a good, you get a dig for buried treasure. I mean, so you get to be cool. part of the team that digs for buried treasure. So, I mean, I mean, truthfully, that's, that's the most fun. It, the most fun is the research. Like it's so intensive, but we get along so well. Right. So everybody gets along and nobody, I've said it a hundred times. We don't step on each other's toes. We just work well together. And Scott keeps us flowing and Rick keeps us flowing and Marty keeps us flowing and, and Craig keeps us going. And that's to me, that's the most fun. It, it's more fun than, than anything that I've mentioned It's just the research. And then 
the things that we find, you know, finding this wood and getting the dates is fun. I know people want us to see us hit treasure, but when we hit dates from the 1700s and wood, we love it. Mm -hmm. That's our search treasure really to us. Yeah. Well, you think about it, like, what is that doing there? That does not belong there. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's a huge mystery. I mean, for us, shaft two did like, so you, um, I'd say did belong there because we calculated that okay. and we hit it again. So that goes, but you're not, you're not wrong. Um, but I'm just going to expand. So shaft two was a lot of work, um, with, you know, Doug, again, the same crew, the same crew I've mentioned a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Um, we took that time to calculate and then bang, 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 we've got wood and it dated to what we wanted it to date at. So you can't make those things up. Yeah. yeah. Well, crazy. It's just impressive stuff, you know? Okay. So like shaft two, that's something that's uh, something that was uh, dug by Daniel McGinnis and his team. Right. And so mm -hmm. um, the fact that you were able to triangulate upon it and dig down, find it where it was supposed to be. And then, um, I don't know. It's just, it, it's mind blowing what you guys do because, uh, and then you add into the other um, element of maybe some kind of watery channel being down there and moving things around a little bit, you know, maybe it's almost lucky that you uh, come across uh, shaft two where it's supposed to be mm -hmm. because some things aren't where they're supposed to be. And right. that's gotta be really maddening and probably pretty cool when you do, uh, when it does all work out. It does. And so again, when you start lining up this historic data that the research team really puts together and you start calculating and overlaying and scaling and putting it on the ground and then digging it up. And it's really cool when something, we find something where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And Fine. even when we find something, um, when we hit something and we're not looking for it, that's a pretty cool moment too. Yeah. I bet. I bet. That's it's cool, a surprise. Cool. <laughs> it's a sweet little surprise. Yeah, you know, it's been fun that we haven't we haven't touched on Gary Drayton. And it's fun to see him just get so excited every time he finds just whatever, you know. It, is he uh, that excitable, like, all the time? Like, or is he, uh, do we, is it, do you ever see a serious side of Gary Drayton? Right. right? Well, I mean, you do. Everybody out there, I think, has a serious side. Gary's very passionate about what he does, but... I mean, what you see with Gary's, that's Gary, right? He's very much like Jack. It's the passion's real and they're excitable guys. And I think that's why they work so well together. I mean, you get to see a glimpse of me work with Jack for maybe a couple episodes, was it? Yeah, on the wash and, table. Yeah. Yeah, and that brings some excitement out of me. I mean, he's an excitable guy, right? So the two of the two excitable guys together, it's just a, a recipe for passion, really. Yeah, they're almost a dream team. Like, I don't know if you've, uh, if you, I think you have a, a version of it up in Canada, but there's a show called The Amazing Race. We think that Jack and Gary would be an amazing team for The Amazing Race, racing around the world, uh, figuring out right. uh, the clues, doing the challenges together. They would be fun to watch. Oh, yeah. They would be fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. Maybe you can run The Amazing Race with Steve or uh, with, with Scott Steve? Barlow. No, with Scott so. Barlow is here. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun? I think we'd win, actually. Yeah, no, I actually think I would win that. Hey, let's nominate. Yeah, let's like let's, let's put let's in an application. Happen. Let's make this happen. This this would be rad. <laughs> Scott's a smart guy. I would do the amazing race. There's very few people, right? Because I have a big personality. But I would do the amazing race with Scott, and I think we'd win it. That would be great. Hmm. You guys would be uh, you know, you're already on a big TV show. You could bring those viewers to the amazing race. It's a match made in heaven. You can bring more people to watch the amazing race just because of what you do on Oak Island. It's true. Great. I don't, the sad part is nobody's flying anytime soon. I know. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> it gives us time for a campaign. Yeah. Right. So perfect. Perfect. It, it's like a good time to be. Okay, wait, you mentioned working at the wash table with Jack. You've spent a lot of time at the wash table and you're pulling up all kinds of stuff. Like it's Eagle Eyes Steve over there. <laughs> so are you spending a lot more time at the wash table or? Well, so that's the end of the year, right? I don't know what month. I'd, it all sort of mingles together because we work such long days. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to October, November. I don't really remember, maybe it's probably October. And um, so the search, as Rick called it, the research and development, it's over. Mm. We're in the treasure hunting stage. So there's not a whole lot left to do in terms of, you know, the swamp work is probably done. Uh, Smith's code is probably done. And 
at that point in time, it's Jack and I work together. So let's put Steve and Jack together and let them search. And we worked well together. Mm -hmm. Right? Like we found a lot of stuff, a lot of cool stuff. Well, somebody's got to go through the spoils, right? Right. Yeah. I love it. Dan Hensky was pretty good there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was Dan Hensky using? Yes. Like he, you gave him a little tool. And he starts picking through the spoils with it. And DJ was like, is that a bone? Like, what is that? Like, is that a, it was a stick? Huh? He had this little stick. I just think it was a stick. I think. I remember. It looked like a little wishbone, really, like off of turkey. Yeah. Just a big one. It but it was just a stick. <laughs> but he was really efficient with it. Hey, don't don't question Dan Hensky's methods. You you know what he's capable of. He is a I know. genius, okay? But... I was so impressed. He walked up and Steve instantly knew. He said, do you want your tool? And he went and got it. And I was like, did he just hand him like a human bone or something to look through? The Who did that? You. Was that me? Yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, you know what Dan's tools are. You just go get them for him. There you go. You do what you do. <laughs> That's I just stuff. didn't know how to take that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just, so sometimes you just, uh, do for Dan. Come on. He's like, uh, he's the senior member of the team now. Of and he just knows everything. If Dan needs it, he does know everything. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to just, you know, if we were coming there this week, like we would, would have hoped, he would have been someone I would have loved to just, uh, if we could oh, get yeah. a couple minutes of just to chat about whatever, because I would just love to hear about whatever mm -hmm. from, from Dan Hensky. So, yeah. all right. Um, he's super smart. So, yeah. I'm sure you, he would give you guys an interview. Yeah, oh, I would love it. That would be so killer. <laughs> so Amazing. good. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So um, let me see here. Oh, actually, we're getting down to the end of our questions here. Um, we did want questions from the uh, chat, but our chat broke. And so apologize uh, for that. Some of them I'll be able to go through. Let's ask a couple more and then... Yeah, because we wanted to pull in a couple of questions from the chat. We but still can. Yeah, we might be able to. Let's see. Let's see what she can do. But, Let me work my magic. Um, yeah. So I heard that uh, you had um, a mishap in the swamp. Can you talk to us about your mishap in the swamp, or is that like oh. a catchy? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Is it just when I, I you know, I we've all fallen in the swamp. It's probably oh. just that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's we've all done it. You just, it's you fall in, you get wet, you stink really bad. That's when you, and it can actually stick to your clothing and your skin. That's when you smell it. Mm. Gross. <laughs> Not, uh, uh. That's, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't want to fall down the swamp. That's just me. Even though I can handle the smell, I think. I don't yeah. like to be, I don't like getting dirty. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like a germaphobe, you know, so I don't want any of that. To, uh, I'll get dirty. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah. It's not that bad. I'm a germaphobe. The guys will tease me about that, right? Like I was Mr. Lysol all season. Okay. Yeah, we've like any on the island now. Oh, I do. I like Lysol everything constantly. Good and man. I know they, listen, I kept them healthy. They just didn't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> Doing your part. You, you see, you go above and beyond, right? That's right. Yeah. For sure. All right. Um, so do you have do you have anything you could tell us that we don't know about you that would be interesting to listeners or fans? Like, I don't know. Um, wh like, wh what is, uh, do you have any fun hobbies that aren't uh, surveying or uh, falling in the swamp? <laughs> Not really. I, I mean, I grew up playing a lot of hockey and baseball. Fun. I big leaf fan, Maple Leafs. So again, a lot of people up here are Montreal or Toronto fans and on the island it's a, an ongoing debate you know Laird and some of the camera guys are Montreal fans so that's a big you know mm. big dude Doug and I are big Maple Leaf fans so we push the Maple Leaf side mm. um, yeah, don't the Canadians have a couple more Stanley Cups they have a few more but we don't talk about those <laughs> yeah I need to talk to Laird because is it Oh, he's not a treasure hunter never mind that's he, right. he wanted to make sure he wasn't a you know quote unquote treasure hunter right. but uh, there's this uh, treasure in Montreal that we that I really want to go look for, and I was going to see if he could help, but probably not. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, one this is like one of the big questions um, that like Deidre is always fascinated by this. And she anybody we talk to about Oak Island, this is the first thing she asks them. So, are you a Rick or are you a Marty? 
Oh, I think I already asked, sort of answered this. You sort of answered it, uh, but so I'm a, I would say a combination of the two, right? Like, I like the go-go from Marty. <clears throat> I like the <clears throat> sorry. I like the passion from Rick. Yeah. But I'm going to go off. I'm going to say I'm a Craig guy because it's a combination. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I, uh, man, Craig. I, I wish we heard more from him on the show. I, yes, seriously. You know, um, because like. I watch him and I could just see like him thinking hard and um, almost seeing like the numbers and stuff flashing before his yep. eyes, because you could just tell that he's like super deep into thinking about whatever is like got his attention. So is that like accurate? Cause he, he seems oh, like yeah, he's very accurate. focused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's super focused. And often we're looking for very similar things, patterns, data, um, something to help us. So in terms of sitting and talking and, and uh, working well together. I mean, I work well with all three. I think we all get along, but I spend a lot of time with Craig, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time or, you know, in small groups, there might be three of us. So Doug, Terry, myself, or um, Craig, Terry, like interchangeable, but I work a lot with Craig and almost daily communication, either via text or phone call or emails. That's awesome. Yeah, he he's, um, I don't know. I. I just, like I said, I wish we got more of him, you know, but it'd be really nice. Yeah. He, yeah. he just seems super cool and, you know, super smart. Um, so there's one guy that we haven't touched on at all yet. Charles Barkhouse. Yes. Yeah. Charles, I was going to bring him up. Yeah. He was almost going to be my survey assistant. What's that? I was when it was, uh, in my head, it was, a uh, close. Am I going to pick Jack Bailey or Charles Barkhouse mm -hmm. as my survey? And it'd be Charles just because of the stories that he can tell you, right? Like he knows anything and everything about that island. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I um, he would be on t one of the people on the top of my list to uh, chat with at some point because uh, we were hoping that he would give us a tour this week, you know? Right. <laughs> but I don't think that's happening now. So um, actually, I know we know it's not happening, <laughs> but like uh, I don't know. I just I think that he is super cool. He's super smart and. You know, he just knows everything about Oak Island. Mm -hmm. And so he would be the, one of the people at the top of my list to just pick their brain oh, about yeah. basically anything because who's going to know it if not Charles Barkhouse, right? But, uh, for serious. Yeah. Charles or Dan, between the two of those guys, they know everything. Yeah. Right. Like, so if you need data or if I need data to push the research, you talk to Charles or Dan. Cool. Yeah. They, right? he, so, he seems pretty cool too. Um, yeah. He's a pretty relaxed guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. Cool. Um, do we have any questions Sorry. from the chat? Um, so yeah, with the chat being broken, I didn't have any on that side. I do have a couple that were sent to me okay. from listeners. Hang on. Let's see here. Aaron is asking if you know how accurate the blacksmith estimates of age age of items he looks at. So if Carmen Leg mm -hmm. have any idea when they're tested or what the accuracy no. <clears throat> that would be a layered question unfortunately yeah I, sorry for me i'm just going to take carmen leg's word he seems of like course. he knows what it's all about okay, yeah let's see here okay so rose asks how deep and wide <laughs> and long is the solution channel if that's something you can tell us um we don't we don't really know we have a an understanding of what we believe it is um but that's something we're, we're going to work on this year. That's part of the big research this year. Mm -hmm. If I'm guessing at the top of my head, and this is pure guess, okay? So I'm just throwing out a number based on what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, it might be 20 feet wide, okay. 30 feet wide. Jeez. It's, it's fairly big. substantial. We can put some of those big caissons right down in it, right? So I would say 20 or 30 feet wide. But that's just based on a pure guess. But it's big and it's powerful. Hmm. Yeah, you guys moved up from the five foot case on to the eight foot case on. Mm -hmm. And then when we were talking mm -hmm. to Beth, she says they have 12 feet, feet case on. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it sounds to me like you need 100 foot. But, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, see when we get there. we'll see when we get there. <laughs> yeah. So, did you well, it, I mean, and it's coming. And so the research we're doing now for, and that we will be doing once this is lifted. You know, we don't know what the money pit search is um, and we can't really speak to it, but I can tell you the solution channel would play a big role in the big dig because 
it's a lot of water and mud and muck moving around down there. So um, if we went that, if we go that route, we have to pick the right technology. Yeah, well, makes sense. I, I, I don't know. Personally, I hope you guys do a big dig, <laughs> but uh, I know that Craig was really into that uh, the ice thing. Um, I don't even remember what it's called. The one, the the ring of ice that the you, freeze ring. Yeah, the freeze ring. There you go. Yeah, I mean uh, that sounds cool. Um, I don't know if it's any better than the uh, what they were showing on the fi season finale. Actually, mm -hmm. I guess they showed both. But yeah. I don't know. I'm excited for whatever you guys do. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're just itching to yeah. get out there. Yeah, we hope you guys can get out there really soon and just, you know, oh, um, yeah, get some get some stuff <laughs> going. I suspect by June or July, once we start, some of the other provinces have already started lifting the regulations, okay. letting people go back to work and gather. I, yeah. I, I mean, we have a lot of cases and it's slowing. I think there's less than 300 current active cases in Nova Scotia. So yeah. Yeah, we're, United, we're heading. Yeah. In the United States, that's some, it's happening down here too. Some places are, you know, slowly getting back to like work and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Hey, if it's safe, let's do it, but you know, let's get safe. Right. Safety first. Yeah. yeah so, um, is that it? Is that yeah, all that's about okay. all I have. Uh, the only other thing people keep asking is about Fred Nolan's maps, and we've really already touched on that. Uh, apparently, everybody wants to know about Fred Nolan's maps. It's fascinating You stuff. and your connection to them. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I can't talk a lot about them, which we talked about, but I, I did give you a little bit, right? Like, he's a surveyor, I'm a surveyor, so I've seen them. Yeah, that's awesome. And they've right, so... Um, and he did some good work. I can say that much. So his work was detailed and accurate. All right. Well, what about um, his son? You know, we have uh, Tom Nolan uh, helping you guys out now. So mm -hmm. uh, has, how's the experience been with uh, working with him on the team now? Tom's been good, right? Like I don't, I don't really work closely with Tom, but I talk to Tom a lot. Um, cool. With the drilling in the swamp, I spent some time with Tom. Tom's really nice. Um, he sticks I would say a lot of his conversations are with the big guys, right? Like the Rick, yeah. Marty, Craig, Scott. Um, so more of his conversations are ongoing with them. But he's, I mean, super nice to deal with. He's given me, when I've asked for information, uh, he's been very candid, so which has been good, very open. Cool. All right. Well, um, that's good to hear. And I guess that kind of wraps this up, right? Yeah. Did hey. you... You had this. Oh, well, I don't know if he was going to be up for that. I was going to um, hold up uh, e each one of our Oak Island trading cards and just have you say the first word that comes to mind. About that want to play? Would you want to play this game? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Hey, but uh, you could just start with him and just leave it with him. Rick, awesome, right? There you go. Mr. Oak Island. And Mr. Oak Island, there you go. <laughs> Mr. Oak Island, does he get a sash and like the whole nine yards? Probably not, probably not. All right. So no, no problem. Um, I just want to say thanks for your time Seriously. and we're going to petition for you and uh, Scott Barlow to get on the amazing race and uh, next year um, during the off season of Oak Island, of course. So you don't have to worry about, Oh yeah. None of this on season business. No yeah. way. Yeah. But no, I just want to say thanks so much for your time. This has been great. We we've, I don't know. This is a thrill, right? Uh, a, a thrill an honor. I'm, I can't believe you said, Yes. Yeah, and... this, we've got so much good stuff here to chew on. I'm going to listen to this podcast probably 15 times. Oh, yes. Uh, that's a lot. We've been almost going. We're pushing. Well, we've been going 100 minutes. Yeah, there you go. Wow. <laughs> wow, it's like a marathon. It is a marathon. No, this has been good. This has been great. So, um, Steve, uh, I just want to say you're awesome. Thanks for your time. Yes, thank um, you. Maybe we'll chat again in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. You should come and hang out during... Uh, trivia every so often it's fun it is fun you guys do a good job of trivia thanks Thank you yeah we tried to like lately i had been having like 10 oak island questions and like 15 general trivia questions but i'm kind of trying to make them equal now it's just hard to come up with oak island o oak island questions maybe i can send you a message and you can give me a couple i don't know yeah we can do that yeah cool sounds good yeah because it's hard to like it's easy to get like general, like you get everything you want. Mm -hmm. You can pick from anything, but when you have to do just Oak Island, I'm like, have I already used something like that? Yeah, probably, probably. use that question again. But 
<laughs> so yeah so if anybody wanted to come and participate on with oak island trivia where you can win cool prizes like these uh cool cards we've been showing off um you can come and hang out with us on friday evenings at uh what time is it at five five, five o'clock pacific <laughs> uh that would be uh, seven o'clock eastern and then over in uh Atlantic time zone with Steve, it's, uh, eight o'clock, eight o'clock. So. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to come do that, please feel free to do so. Uh, do you have anything else? I don't. How about you, Steve? Anything that we missed that you want to make sure people know kind of like Laird wanted to make sure everybody knew he didn't work for the government. Oh, I don't work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. <laughs> That's good stuff. Yeah. You work for, no, uh, technically Oh, go ahead. I was gonna make another joke. I was gonna say I work for I work for the big three. <laughs> Martin Craig. I was gonna say you work for Scott Barlow, but you know. <laughs> I do. I also work for Scott Barlow. Scott Barlow. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Steve, for your time. Um, and I hope we uh chat again in the future. And is that it? Yeah, that's it. We'll let you go. We won't tie up any more of you. <laughs> like, I mean. Thank you for spending that much time. Yes, thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. All right. Have a good evening. So, All right, thanks. Could it be? Night.